Welcome today to Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson. I want to thank you for joining us. We stand at the cusp of a new year, uh, a year that's been breathed with a lot of hope and expectancy by many. Others feeling a sense of uh, despair and uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> terror. I don't know. It depends on where you live and what your persuasions are. But I, for one, am hopeful. I believe the recent uh, political election in the United States was, uh, as Franklin Graham said very recently, uh, God answering the prayers of his people. You know, Franklin Graham conducted a uh, 50 state, almost 50 states, I don't think he made a couple of them, but uh, he conducted a multi-state tour this last year, gathering at state capitals and calling people to prayer. And he said tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans were involved. There was no endorsing of candidates, but there was prayer <coughs> for the hand of God, the blessing of God on our nation again. And uh, Mr. Graham Franklin believes that God answered those prayers. There is a birth of hope again in our land in many ways. The economic uh, picture is looking a little brighter, although that can always be temporary and certainly long term is far from solved. There's also a little bit of spiritual hope because uh, really there was a uh, selection by people as they made their choice for the direction of our nation to return to some more conservative uh, biblical values in terms of family, in terms of sexuality, in terms of uh, just those things that honor God. And of course this naturally upsets a lot of people that are very libertine and want to uh, live any way they choose. And this is always the battle. But in the middle of this new year, as uh, President Obama is winding up his eight years, it seems that a lot of funny things are going on. There's a, a last-minute scramble, and as we gathered in these last days of last year, right around the holidays beginning, just as Christmas Eve was coming and as the Jewish festival Hanukkah was getting started, the United Nations met and passed a resolution uh, that has upset a lot of people. We're going to be talking about that today, so I'm glad you're here with us. And I pray that the Lord will open your heart and mind as we not only look at these events, but we look at them in the light of his holy word. And that's what we try to do at Prophecy in the News. We try to look at the events in the news and bring them in line with the timeless word of God. Because that's where we see the hand of God and we find the truth of God in our world and in our life. Well, it just so happened that, again, the timing uh, right on the eve of Christmas and Hanukkah, which were coincidental in time this year, the United Nations passed a resolution, number 2334, that had a devastating effect. So I want to talk about the sequence of the events that led to this resolution, because it's very much a little bit of a dance as we saw it unfold. First of all, Egypt was going to propose this resolution to the UN Security Council initially. <coughs> Egypt was actually lobbied and pressured, if you will, by Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump, the new president-elect and the prime minister of Israel working together, pressured Egypt or appealed to Egypt. I don't know how much pressure was involved, but they really appealed to Egypt to not make this proposal to the Security Council. And they thought they had bought uh, some time and that they would wait until the new administration when things could be done differently. However, and, and I would say this, uh, we even know that Trump tweeted and uh, was actually in a tweet demanding uh, that Obama uh, instruct his cohorts to veto the resolution if it did come forward. You see the way the Security Council works, it's not the entire Assembly of the United Nations, it's a, it's a smaller cohort and the Security Council passes these resolutions and the United States and about four or five other nations actually have a single vote veto power. So historically and traditionally there have been many run-ups to this kind of scenario. This resolution as you'll see is about smacking Israel down. There have been many attempts to do this but the United States has always vetoed such resolutions and therefore they have stopped dead in their tracks stalled out we've used our veto power to be a friend to Israel we'll see why that matters in a few moments from the word of God but that's been our historic position as a nation and uh, we've we've seen the blessing of God I think because of that on our land but this time was different and uh, I would say that President Obama has certainly not been a strong friend to Israel uh, many would even call him an enemy but I certainly know he has really not stood with Israel. And this time he just chose and instructed his uh, underlings to look the other way as the vote was taken. What happened was Egypt pulled back and uh, so some other nations stepped up. 
the, the uh, resolution was actually proposed by New Zealand and Venezuela and Malaysia, those three nations. And they lobbied uh, some of the, on the council, which wasn't very hard to do. And as the vote was taken, uh, Samantha Power, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, simply sat back and abstained. She refused to vote, to go on record. She did not exercise the veto power. And for the first time, the resolution of this nature passed. And we're going to talk about why the consequences of that are so important. Well, there were several reactions in the downdraft of that, and I can just tell you they were all over the map. Something that never happens, uh, right there in the Security Council chamber, all of the delegates stood and gave a standing ovation to themselves. And I want you to think about this. Here is a resolution that, in effect, and we'll unpack it in a minute, is, is condemning Israel. And uh, many on this council are no friends of Israel. Many of them are friends of Arabs. Many of them are Islamic. But they actually stood and gave an ovation when the resolution passed. And that's uh, really not proper protocol or conduct in such a chamber for such an event. But they couldn't seem to restrain themselves. They were thrilled that the veto that usually smacked these things down did not come as the United States chose to close its eyes and look the other way. Uh, another reaction was uh, Mr. Trump immediately tweeted when he got word of this, uh, wait until January 20th. That simple tweet gave great assurance to Israel, and Benjamin Netanyahu and many of the Israelis, Israeli government took a lot of comfort, and many of the citizens of Israel, uh, again, are very hopeful and uh, almost daring to believe that the United States will once again be a strong ally for them in the dangerous region in which they are nestled. And so uh, there is hope again in Israel. In the United States, reactions were mixed. Uh, predictably, those who are anti-Semitic against Israel, those who are very upset uh, and, and in the name of their liberal doctrines uh, want to eliminate the nation of Israel and call them oppressive or even an apartheid nation, uh, they were uh, cheering it on as well. Many, even liberal Jews who supported Obama throughout his term, however, expressed dismay and surprise. Uh, many liberal Jews do not like the nation state of Israel, but many do. And Alan Dershowitz, who is, uh, who is uh, very well known and very well educated, he even made the statement because Obama had gone on record last year at a meeting of a political action committee for Israel. Uh, he had said to the Jewish Americans gathered there, he had Israel's back. And Mr. Dershowitz made the statement. He said he had our back. I didn't know it so he could stab us in the back. But that's how he felt about it and expressed really the sentiments of many, I believe, as well. Well, these things go on and off the record, we're told, coming out of uh, Israel from their intelligence and from Netanyahu and others, uh, they said that the resolution itself, by the crafting of its very wording, by its intent, by all that it was doing, actually had the fingerprints of the United States all over it. Of course, the uh, Obama administration vehemently denied such a thing, but now we have records of an uh, of a off-the-record meeting that took place in late December with our ambassador, Samantha Powers, with Ben Rhodes, who is a security advisor in the Obama administration, and with members of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the Muslim Brotherhood. They met together uh, in D.C. and uh, at a time that would have been very conducive to crafting this kind of a resolution. So we can just look at this and realize uh, something has happened, something's gone forward in this last uh, end of the year that has not happened uh, really since the regathering and reformation of the State of Israel in 1948. The U.N. has been allowed to go on record as the U.S. looked the other way and didn't use its power to defend her. The U.N. has gone on record condemning Israel, not only really uh, her, her right to her lands, but her really very existence has been questioned and her long-term uh, claim to the land. This is very significant, and so this is the sequence of, requ of recent events. Colonel Ralph Peters, who often appears uh, as a commentator on national news and has a military background he said obama's strategy has really been throughout the administration as he sees it colonel ralph peters to praise muslims to ignore christians to blame jews he says that has been the obama policy toward the middle east so these are the sequence of recent events that happened as you and I were preparing to have our figgy pudding and celebrate with our family and nobody was paying attention because the festivities were beginning, working almost secretly and cloaked in the dark, the United Nations 
pull this off. Now let's talk about the seriousness of the resolution's effects. What does this actually do? Well, first of all, a UN resolution is not binding on the United States. And so although Obama's limited number of days in administrative power may respect this resolution, the new administration is, as Trump tweeted, wait till January 20th, things will be different. They're going to ignore it. Uh, we're not bound by it. There have been calls, and the, uh, the new Congress is in session even this week as, as I'm taping this, and they're putting forward <coughs> legislation to condemn this resolution and go on record uh, just really expressing their abhorrence of it. But as that is happening, realize, even though the U.S. can ignore this, it's on the books. And the last time a U.N. resolution was actually reversed, I'm told it was a 16-year process to get that done. So it doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen easily. It's there. It's on the books. And it's appealed to and used as a basis for international law. Now, the seriousness of this, again, I want to put in perspective. Let's look at the entire Middle East. Iran is developing nuclear capability, not only for energy, as they claim, but for weapons. Terrorists are continuing to be funneled money and support from Iran in nations surrounding Israel. The charter of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, itself says that Israel has no right to even exist. And they will not be content until every Jew is pushed into the sea. At the very same time <clears throat> as all of that's going on, you have a monumental humanitarian crisis in Syria. Because of Obama's strategies, really, and Hillary Clinton, Syria has become a hotbed of civil war. And there's such a turmoil and unrest. Half a million civilian deaths and a few military in there but half a million deaths. Now, our UN ambassador, Samantha Power, has famously been on record and even done some of her scholarly dissertations being appalled at how the U.S. has looked the other way during these kind of crises. But this has been on her watch, and she owns this one. Half a million people dead. The city of Aleppo basically destroyed in northern Syria. And hundreds of thousands of refugees who are now fleeing for their safety, and some, as terrorists, settling and infiltrating into Europe with heightened attacks of terrorism there. With that going on, with the humanitarian crisis, with the Iranian nuclear advancement, what does the UN choose to do? They choose to smack down Israel for building buildings on land that they say they have no right to. It's as if you've got, let's say, a local city with gang warfare and kids being shot and killed. And the city council meeting, the only thing they're worried about is somebody's grass is growing too high over on 7th Street. Now, you've lost all perspective, and I believe that's very deliberate, and it's very tragic. The other thing is, uh, the U.S. can ignore this, <coughs> but this resolution will become the basis for international laws in the future. And we can look for the UN to try to uh, go forward with this. And this is really why I think this resolution was a prep, a first step, if you will, a preliminary action to go back to the failed two-state solution. Let me tell you again, if many of you are familiar with these things and many of you may be new to this and you need to get acquainted with these facts as you study biblical prophecy and the role of Israel in the last days. The world, remember, man's ways are not God's ways. And we can try to get peace. We're not against peace. I'm for peace talks and peace efforts. But let's realize, until God is rightly honored and the Prince of Peace is enthroned, there is no lasting peace. We can do our best to try to work things out. But the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so the typical world solution, which uh, isn't always as upfront and honest as it needs to be, is, well, let's just create two states out of this land. Let's give Israel some land, and let's give Palestine some land. There never has been an actual nation of Palestine. That word was applied by the Romans to the land after they destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, and they dispersed the Jews because of the Jewish uh, insubordination and rebellion against Rome. 
and Rome just finally came down with an iron fist and destroyed the temple, uh, destroyed the city, uh, left it in rubble, and they began to call the land Palestine, which was Latin for Philistine. They were saying that Israel's ancient foe, the Philistines, which, which would, would have been to the south and west of the land of Israel, they were saying, uh, we're going to call it by that name. There is no modern nation of Palestine. In fact, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was organized in the 1960s by a group of terrorists, and their simple purpose is to really try to eliminate and drive Israel out of the land. And without going into all the history, just realize that when Israel was granted the right to come home in 1948 by the UN and backed by the United States, President Harry Truman, that was a, that was a, a miracle. That was a, a fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, of the, the dead bones coming together and the the muscles and the sinew and the flesh and breathing life into it. We saw the resurrection of a dead nation uh, over all those centuries. The people had been there, but the nation state uh, was in the graveyard of history, but God raised it up. We've never seen anything else like it in human history. You can look and you can't find anything similar to it. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So as you think about these things, uh, we've seen that in our life, and this is just a desire by the ancient enemies of God and of Israel to put this down, to push it down. The two-state solution would say, let's split the land, let's deny Israel uh, the right to the Temple Mount, and let's make Jerusalem be a split capital. Well, that just really isn't ever going to work. You know, If we got, ever got into a, a real uh, international dispute with American and Mexican territories, could you imagine if we let the UN decide these things and they chose to give Arizona and California to Mexico, and they said, by the way, we're going to move the U.S. capital to Los Angeles, and half of it will be for Mexico, and half of it will be for the United States. Those kind of solutions are, are just not practical. They can't work. You can't force that kind of unity on a people. And so the U.N., as my friends in Israel have said, the U.N., in, in their eyes, stands for the United Nothings, because they really promise much and deliver very, very little. Well, the coming peace conference in January... John Kerry and, and others in the Obama administration are going to be meeting for a peace conference in mid-January, just before the inauguration. And I believe there the UN is going to push hard as they can with U.S. support in the waiting days of Obama's administration to force a two-state solution on Israel. And Benjamin Netanyahu recognized that. That's why he pushed so hard back when this resolution first emerged. And John Kerry really let the mask slip off because he gave a speech to the UN after this resolution, and he made this statement. I want you to listen to this. He said, Israel can either be a democracy or be Jewish, but she can't be both. I vehemently disagree with that statement. Israel is a democracy, and Israel is Jewish. And as a democracy, they have allowed Arabs in their land, Arabic peoples, the right to vote, the right to run for office, the right to hold office, the right to organize politically. In fact, the Arabs who live in Israel live about as well as any other Arabs in the entire Middle East as far as freedoms and democracy. And for John Kerry to say that shows his worldview is totally skewed. Now, I want to wrap these things up by coming to the Word of God. And just if you want to go deeper on this, let me just offer you a resource today. The, the late, great Tim LaHaye, who was called to heaven this last year, one of the last books he authored with uh, Dr. Ed Heinsohn is called Target Israel. This was uh, published near the end of 2015. It's a good overview of the things we've talked about, not this resolution, but about the history of the nation of Israel, their rebirth in the 1948, and how God brought all that to pass, and his plans for them in the last days. I want to close by appealing to some scriptures with you, if I can, about Israel and her right to the land. First of all, I'll give you some sections of Scripture you can look at on your own. Romans 9 and 10 and 11. The gospel of salvation is in the epistle to the Romans. And when Paul comes down to Romans 9, he pivots from the glory of salvation for the security of knowing Christ. He pivots to the question, but wait a minute. What about Israel? Has God forgotten Israel? And he takes three chapters to show God has not forgotten Israel. And he explained so well in chapter 11, right now blindness spiritually has happened to Israel in part. They don't see their Messiah. They don't see all the spiritual realities. 
But that's so that the fullness of the Gentiles, those of us that are outside of Israel, could come into Christ and be filled in the church. And then the Bible says at the right time in the ultimate plan of God, the Lord will return to Zion and they will turn to him. And so there will be a salvation and a deliverance for many of the people of Israel. Now, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are mainly speaking of the people of Israel, not the land, but the people. And the people are the nation, but it doesn't really deal with the land. So just realize that God did not cast them off as a people. He's not done with them. The Messiah came from them. They gave us the scriptures. The covenants came from them. The glory was given to them. So much uh, God's worked in human history through these people called Israel. So he's not done with it. That's in Romans. Then when we go into Genesis, we look at the patriarchs, that is, the founding fathers of the nation of Israel. And you see in Genesis that after the flood, the nations disperse. And in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, there's what's called the table of nations and the Tower of Babel and the rebellion against God. And God scatters the nations. And it's in Genesis 12 that God calls out a man, Abraham, and says, I'm going to make a nation of you. I'm going to make a people of you. And through your seed, I'm going to bless all the peoples of the earth. God's plan was to work through a man who forged a nation miraculously by God, which would be the source of revelation, the vehicle of God's message to the human race. So Israel had that key role as a servant of God. And in Genesis 15, verses 7 and 8, God said that he would uh, justify Abraham. He was counted righteous because he believed God because of his faith. And the Bible says in Genesis 15, 7 and 8, the Lord said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of, the, out of the Chaldee to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And so Abraham enters this covenant ceremony where he cuts these animals in half and, and he walks through the midst of the animals halves on either side of him and then God passes through with it with a floating torch and a a smoking uh, presence and it's the glory of God it's the light and the smoke the Shekinah and together they walk through these cut animals and the covenant the cutting was saying that may it be done to me if I ever break (coughs) my promise may what's done to these animals be done to me so God said I'm making an unconditional promise to you that was to Abraham and then to Abraham's son Isaac it is repeated again in chapter 26 in verses 3 and 4. Genesis 26, 3 and 4. And let me read you those verses because, again, this is the new generation, the son of Abraham. The Lord says to Isaac, sojourn, stay in the land. There's a famine going on. And I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform, <laughs> God's good, isn't he? I will perform that which I swear unto Uh, Abraham thy father so God renews that promise to Isaac and then finally Isaac has a son named Jacob and again in Jacob is given the same promise and this is in Genesis 35 and I'll just read verse 12 as I turn there you'll want to hear the word of God here it's very very clear now to the third generation from Abraham this is said to Jacob the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac To thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're always mentioned together. Uh, They're they're an echo of the Trinity because God is Father, Son, and Spirit, and God loves triads and triplets. And so here you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the founders, the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, and God speaking clearly. And then the great passage that to me settles all doubt is in Jeremiah 31 because some have said well uh, those promises were conditioned on uh, Israel recognizing the Messiah and Israel rejected Jesus and so God revoked that covenant he pulled away and and took the land and all of that's Old Testament we don't need that anymore but if we really believe the Bible is the Word of God and we really believe that God means what he says let me just suggest this to you God says in Jeremiah 31 Verse 3, I've loved you, Israel, with an everlasting love. And then he says down in verse 31, this is so powerful. (coughs) Days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. 
But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And this is quoted in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews about the new covenant that Christ came to bring. But then he goes on to say, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. In verse 35, thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea with the waves uh, thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall uh, cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Now that's the people, right? But then verse 38, the days come, saith the Lord, the city shall be built. And then it gives very specific, uh, really, uh, deliberations about the building of the city and the different towers that will go up. And it was, it was partially fulfilled when Nehemiah came and rebuilt the gates, but it's ultimately fulfilled when Messiah comes and rebuilds the gates. And God says, as long as you see the sun in the sky, as long as the ocean roars and the tides come in and go out, Israel's going to be a nation before me. We've lived to see a great fulfillment of that in our own lifetime. And I can't believe that God would break that promise. If he breaks that promise, how can I know that he means it when he said, if you believe in me, you have everlasting life. Let's close on this note. Israel is not our Savior. We love the people. We pray <coughs> for the peace of Jerusalem. But out of Israel came Jesus the Messiah. He went to the cross, died, rose again, that we might have our sins forgiven and God might remember our iniquities no more. Jesus made that new covenant possible. But at the time of the end, he will again work through Israel to call the nations to himself and reveal his glory globally. These are exciting times to be alive. Realize that the word Jacob, the last patriarch, means a trickster, a deceiver. Jacob wrestled face to face with God, with Christ, and he was broken. And God said, I'm going to name you Israel, Prince of God. And you can become a child of God if you give your life to Christ. Let's keep looking up. Thank you.